Our cover story tonight is about China's silent war on India. This will shock you. A man has been accused of spending millions of dollars in India in order to spread pro-China propaganda. That's right. It's a sinister ploy to say the least. It's a silent war and a murky web of trying to buy bias and influence. Who exactly is this man? What's behind this plan? And how exactly was he executing it? Who all were involved? And how was the lid blown off? On Gravitas tonight, we get you these answers as we join the dots and bring you the bigger picture. Also on the show for you tonight, Stockholm has emerged as Europe's new crime capital. We tell you why the crime rates in Sweden have been attracting global concern now. There is a new COVID variant on the prowl, should you be worried. Iran is gaslighting women who defy the hijab law and sending them off to take psychiatric treatment. Are you too drunk to drive back home? Italy has a plan to get you home safe. We tell you more. Our cover story is about a man who has been accused of waging a war in India. It's a fireless war. It's a war of narrative, a war of misinformation and disinformation. It is China's war of influence. And Beijing's foot soldier in this war is Neville Roy Singham. A New York Times investigation has accused him of spending millions of dollars in India in order to spread pro-China propaganda. But this is not the first time Singham's name has come up for something fishy. Raids previously have led Indian authorities to Singham. Now, don't get fooled by his Bollywoodish name. Neville Roy Singham is an American, but he sits thousands of miles away in Shanghai, close to the Chinese seat of power, running his large network of propaganda machines masquerading as shell companies and NGOs. Last week, Singham was reportedly attending a workshop on ways to spread Chinese propaganda. He once founded a company called ThoughtWorks Inc. The website claims, Roy is a globally renowned information technology thought leader. So why is this thought leader being accused of influencing people's thoughts in favor of China? Why is he oiling the Chinese propaganda machinery in India? Is his resume nothing but a cover? In India, Singham reportedly poured money into a website called News Click. It is run by PPK News Click Studio Private Limited. In the year 2021, this website came under the radar of India's Enforcement Directorate. ED claimed that News Click had received questionable foreign funding amounting to 38 crore rupees. So on the 9th of February, the ED raided News Click. At least 10 of its premises were searched. The raid lasted five days. New York Times now claims, I'm quoting, Singham's network financed a news site, News Click, that sprinkled its coverage with Chinese government talking points. And this is what the website looks like. Nothing obviously suspicious there. No red color or Chinese flag, of course. Not too long ago, News Click filed a story that declared Oppenheimer film should remind us who is the real enemy of the people. And who is that? Definitely not China. The story reads, and I'm quoting, for young internationalists and anti-imperialists in the United States, it is essential for us to listen clearly to the people of West Africa and the Sahel. Western media has been spinning nefarious tales of Russian and Chinese growing influence in the region. Two years ago, NewsClick filed this story. China claims to achieve eradication of absolute poverty. Also two years ago, NewsClick asked, can China lead the way to a low-cost, low-carbon future? And here's another story. Economically, the US is a declining power. China is a rising power. The message is clear. China will only follow the path of socialism. 
how U.S. aggression on China will destabilize global trade and tech. Would you call the reportage slash coverage neutral or is there an obvious bias there? Singham is accused of buying this bias on behalf of China. How exactly, you wonder? Through charities and shell companies. In April 2018, for example, a company named Worldwide Media Holdings LLC invested 9.59 crores into PPK NewsClick. Worldwide Media is now defunct. It was based out of Delaware and it was part of Singham's network. Between 2018 and 2021, NewsClick received money from four different entities linked to Singham. It in fact received 27.51 crore from Justice and Education Fund located in the United States, 26.98 lakhs from G-SPAN LLC, again located in the United States. 49.31 lakhs came in from the Tricontinental Limited Inc. USA and 2.03 lakhs were sent from a certain Centro Popular Demidas Brazil. And what was this money for? Export of services claimed NewsClick. What services? New York Times claims to have quote-unquote tracked hundreds of millions of dollars to groups linked to Singham that mix progressive advocacy with Chinese government talking points. NewsClick, mind you, is just one of the many ways in which Singham is pushing the Chinese narrative into the mainstream discourse. Singham finances YouTube videos that promote pro-Chinese narrative. In Shanghai, for example, one of his companies co-produced a YouTube show along with the city's propaganda department. Singham finances NGOs that slyly tow the Chinese line. The New York Times also claiming that Singham and his network meet, uh, meet congressional aides, train politicians in Africa, they help in organizing protests, and the end goal here is to create an eco chamber where the Chinese narrative is celebrated, even promoted. And then when protesters or a politician paid by Singham or trained by Singham says something pro-China, New York Times claims Chinese media accounts retweet people and organizations in Singham's network at least 122 times since February 2020. Nothing here is genuine. Everything is tailored, orchestrated and funded, it seems, to suit the Chinese propaganda campaign. Neville Roy Singham is a reminder of how China's narrative war has gone beyond state-funded media outlets and the Confucius Institute. Beijing has spread its tentacles, roped in third parties. They may be anywhere, they may be anyone. What may look like independent content or a journalistic piece on China may, ha may have its roots soaked in Chinese money and tasked with influencing your views on China, making you look at the world through China's lens and fall for the Chinese lie. Only a few years back, Sweden was a peaceful welfare state. Well, not anymore. A lot has changed. And now it has become Europe's crime capital, a hotspot of gun homicides. In fact, the number of shootings has shot up in Sweden and how. Gang violence is soaring, perpetrators have become younger, more and more teenagers are taking up guns, firing bullets from rifles they can barely hold. Have a look at these headlines. This one is from June. There was a shooting in the Swedish capital Stockholm. A 15-year-old boy was killed. Three other people were injured. Soon there was a car chase. Two suspects were arrested. The motive of the attack still remains unknown. And then there was this case of revenge shooting. Serdar Sarehan was a real estate agent in Stockholm. He came from a family of Turkish migrants. For years, in fact, Serdar built up a good life for himself and his family. But his son created trouble. 
He went off the rails in his late teens. In March, a Swedish television program broadcast Edem's name and photograph. He was wanted in connection with a shooting in Uppsala. The shooting targeted the family of an infamous crime baron. And this painted a target on the backs of Edem's relatives. Soon after the broadcast, gunmen knocked on his father's door. Sadar Sarehan was shot dead as his wife and daughter slept upstairs. Another 15-year-old was shot dead in January, not in an isolated alleyway or a shady area, by the way, but in a sushi restaurant in a crowded shopping plaza. He was shot between his eyes, execution style, in front of a room full of diners. Another 15-year-old was later arrested on suspicion of his murder. And days before this, two explosions rocked an apartment block in a suburb in Stockholm. A mother and daughter cried as they saw a football-sized hole in the wall of their home. The police believe it was in retaliation for a shooting outside a McDonald's restaurant, which killed one and injured two. Harrowing, isn't it? One crime leading to another. A chain of shootings and revenge shootings. And these were just a few cases, by the way. According to police records, 144 such incidents took place in the first five months of 2023. Do you know what that means? On an average, there was one shooting every day. At least 20 people have been killed due to gun violence this year. Last year, there were 391 shootings in Sweden. 62 people were killed. And a year before that, there were 344 shooting incidents. 45 had been murdered. Sweden has roughly the same population as London. Yet, the gun murder rate in its capital, Stockholm, was roughly 30 times higher per capita than London. It was also 2.5 times the European average. It's still far better off than the United States. But according to European standards, it's alarming to say the least. While the level of violent crime has stayed relatively stable in Sweden, the proportion of deadly gun crime and attacks with explosives has skyrocketed. Lives have been lost. Laws and policies have been changed. The violence even brought down a whole government gang. Crime was the divining issue of last year's election campaign. But the shootings and the explosions have only increased. The government pins the blame on the integration of migrants. Today, one-fifth of all people living in Sweden were born outside the country. An overwhelming majority of gang criminals are young Swedish men born abroad or whose parents or grandparents emigrated to the country. In the 2015 asylum wave, Sweden imported all kinds of criminality due to migrants. But Germany, for that matter, took in even more refugees and is not facing such issues. So again, the question is, why is this happening in Sweden? Here's what the police suspect. Gang leaders in Sweden are hungry for power. They are competing to control illegal drug sales. And the race has now turned deadly. It has evolved into a cycle of revenge attacks. Warring factions have been rampaging around Stockholm. Gangsters use bombs to send each other warnings. Assassins shoot one another dead. Young children immune from prosecution under Swedish law are being sent to carry out the attacks. Such is the state of affairs in Sweden. How will it solve its gun problem then? The country's police union has urged the government to set up a crisis commission. The government has boosted the budget for police and the criminal justice system. Yet, the shootings have continued unabated. The most striking aspect here is how normal they have become. The crimes are being reported as part of everyday life. Sweden is giving the world Nordic noir fiction. And it does not seem to be ending anytime soon.
Sri Lanka is looking to transform its education system. End of term examinations are being scrapped. Students will now be given just one workbook each term. Colombo says the idea here is to reduce the weight of the school bags and also to help the children keep their spine straight. But will these measures interfere with a child's learning curve? Here's a detailed report. There aren't too many people who would tell you that they love exams. The word is often synonymous to nightmares, sweaty palms, anxiety and last moment preparation. Which is why we are sure students in Sri Lanka are celebrating today. The country's education ministry has decided to relieve the students of the burden of exams. Starting in 2024, students in Sri Lanka will be able to take only one exam a year. How many do they currently take? Mostly one every term. So say a school has three terms, spring, summer and winter, then the students have to take three exams every year. That comes down to one now. What's more, starting in 2024, students will have just one workbook for each term. So, if there are three terms, students will have just three workbooks for each academic year. Here's a question. How much can you possibly fit into that workbook and how many subjects? It is unclear whether the plan is to have one workbook per subject or one workbook for all subjects. The latter can be disastrous. Sri Lanka's Minister of Education, Susil Premajayanta, says the reduction in workbooks will make the school bags lighter, also help the students keep their spine straight. But will it be at the cost of compromising with the students' learning curve? There is no doubt that a no-exam situation is utopian. But the reality is that exams often help keep a tab on a child's progress. Is she understanding the concepts being taught to her? Or does she need remedials? How will teachers or parents figure this out with a performance evaluation? If a child underperforms or, God forbid, fails at the end of the year, she stands to lose a whole academic year which again is less than ideal. Sri Lanka plans to have assessments at the end of each module. But the policy's ultimate goal remains blurry. There is the talk of reducing the weight of the school bag and reducing the burden on school students. But the minister also spoke about saving money through this policy. How? He said that one exam a year will save parents the money spent on private tuitions or coaching classes that promise to train the children for competition. Prema Jayanta went on to say that the tuition money could then be spent on food and nutrition. So, is Sri Lanka really looking to transform education? Or is this a way to help Lankans cope with the economic situation at the cost of basic learning?